Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to week five. And in this module, we begin to talk about the duty to act and the liability of public authorities. I will talk more about this particular topic in a short while. But what I'd like to do is to provide a brief review of uh, what we've covered so far in this unit. Uh, you would notice that you know the uh, time appears to fly so fast. We are now in week five. It was only just a few weeks ago that you know we started the term. So we're now in week five, and before we know it, the term is over. And when the term is over, hopefully, you would have picked up a lot of knowledge about torts, which can be pretty handy when you become a lawyer or even just as an ordinary citizen, when you're confronted with situations when certain actions or omissions may lead to harm. Now, we recall though, when we talked about uh, torts in week one and we provided an overview of torts, we said that uh, torts mainly is involved with acts or omissions. Uh, that cause harm or injury when there is a duty of care. And of course, you need to prove causation that it was the uh, negligent act or omission, which uh, led to a breach of the duty of care, uh, which then led to the harm uh, to an individual. And much of tort law has evolved on the basis of the common law or on the basis of decisions made by uh, judges. However, uh, we now know that because of the IP report, uh, which came out in 2002, there have been a lot of uh, changes to the law and torts uh, based on uh, statutory changes, such as the Civil Liability Act 2003 in Queensland, as well as in, in other states. And so we need to be very careful about uh, the way that uh, statute has modified or overridden uh, certain principles that were developed under the common law. Now, going back to, to week two, we talked about, uh, we provided an overview of negligence and duty of care. What was important then in that discussion was that it is not enough that the action or omission of an individual may actually lead to harm to another, which would then mean that there has been uh, a tort that has been committed. It is crucial to establish that there was a duty of care because absent a duty of care, there will, there, there will not be uh, any liability for torts. So torts is mainly based on uh, there being a duty of care. Uh, we know that at its core, the, the duty of care arises from what we know to be the neighbor principle, which was enunciated by uh, the UK courts in the case of Donahue versus Stevenson. And uh, we know that there are now, when, when we talk about, for example, the neighbor principle is, to an extent, it could be based on issues of proximity, but we also know that that can be a very vexing concept because what exactly is proximity? But we're not gonna go that, through that today. We know as well that when we talk about the duty of care, there are established categories of duty of care. Uh, it could be in relation to a school and students or teachers and students. Uh, in relation to a prison authority and um, the, the inmates of a prison authority, the doctor and the, uh, and the patient, the lawyer and the client, and so on, or employer and employees. And in these particular recognized uh, established cases, the, court, the, the law assumes that there is a duty of care so that the actions of an individual does not lead to harm or injury uh, to another, but that is because there is a duty of care. We also said, however, that the fact alone that there is a duty of care and there seems to be a negligent act or omission, and that negligent act or omission causes harm doesn't mean that there is no tortuous liability on the part of a defendant or a tort feeser. What needs to be determined as well is that assuming there is a duty of care, what exactly is the nature of the duty of care and what is the, uh, the standard of care that is involved with the extent of the standard of care? And we canvassed this uh, in week three, and we talked about uh, the case of uh, Wyingshire Council versus Shirt. We talked about issues about reasonable foresee foreseeability and the extent that particular uh, local councils, for example, may be required uh, to take steps to ensure that harm that is not fanciful uh, or, or that events or potential incidents or circumstances that are not fanciful may not lead to a particular harm, harm that is uh, not fanciful or harm that is reasonably foreseeable. 
So we discussed that in week three. In week four, we talked about causation. And in particular, we talked about factual causation as well as uh, legal causation or remoteness or a scope of liability. In week four, we said that it is possible that you, know, uh, you can trace a negligent act or emission as causing harm. So there is a factual link between the act, negligent act or emission and the factual harm. And the harm based on you know, uh, fa a, f an issue of factual causation and uh, questions of logic. However, uh, we know that that can be problematic because there has got to be a point where the negligent act or remission of one person uh, does not encompass all consequential harm or injury. And that is why uh, we said that to the courts, there's often the normative question as to the scope of potential liability. So we've done that in the past uh, four weeks. Now, in this particular topic, when we talk about the duty to act and liability to public authorities, we raise a bigger question here because in the past, when we talked about negligent acts or remission, we saw that the tortuous liability was because a defendant, for example, uh, committed certain negligent actions which caused harm. So in other words, it was the defendant himself, either based on an act or remission, that uh, created the circumstances that would lead to harm to another individual, whether it was a duty of care. Here uh, in week five or in, in module five, our focus relates to the question uh, as to what if there is a plaintiff or a potential victim who suffers harm or, or injury, but the circumstances by which the, the harm or potential injury arose was not because the actions was not because of the actions of a particular defendant. So in other words, what if I did cause the harm or I did cause the circumstances that could potentially lead to harm? Do I have a duty to act? And here we look at uh, issues about, uh, you know, the, is there a duty to act to rescue somebody, for example, or is there a duty to act to, to alleviate injury? or to ensure that somebody does not engage in self-harm. So that's one. We're also gonna be looking at the liability of public authorities as well. So there are two parts to this, uh, to this lecture video. So having said that, at the end of this module, you should be able to understand the legal distinction between acts and pure emissions from both a practical and historical perspective explain the approach of the common law to pure non-feasance or the failure to act or the non-doing and the circumstances in which liability will be imposed, discuss the protection from liability afforded to Good Samaritans and volunteers, identify and explain, explain and apply the principles of liability for public authorities and omissions at both common law and under the Civil Liability Act 2003 Queensland and explain the difference between an action for breach of statutory duty and an action in negligence against public authorities. So there will be two parts in this lecture video, which we're covering this week. Uh, part one talks about the affirmative duty to act. And we're gonna be talking about the missions and special categories of defendants like rescuers and duties to third parties. And in part two, we talk about public authorities as special categories of defendants mainly because public authorities uh, do have affirmative duties to act in relation to the public. That's why they, they have been created. They've been created to act uh, for the interest of the public. And that raises questions of what if the public authority, authority does not act? Or what if the public authority acts and in doing so causes harm? What then? So we're gonna be exploring that uh, in this topic. Although we do know that even when we talk about public authorities in part two, we're gonna to be touching upon that particular topic as well in part one, because when you talk about duties to third parties, uh, part of the examples you provide would be scenarios where there might be prison authorities involved and <clears throat> you have an inmate, for example, that has been bashed by a fellow, fellow prisoner. So that's a public authority, a prison authority. But you know, uh, in that particular case, a, an inmate has been bashed or injured by another, uh, an in, another inmate or, or a fellow prisoner. And we often hear this in the news. 
So we're going to be talking about that as well. Okay, so uh, let's begin. Uh, we recall then we, when we talked about negligence, it is defined both as an act and a mission. So it could be a negligent act, it, which consists in the, the bad doing or the doing of something bad or something negligent. Or it could be in the form of an omission or a non doing or a failure to act that then leads to harm or injury to another person. Again, when there was a duty of care. Uh, if you recall, the, the first time that the neighborly principle arose uh, was in the case of Don Hugh Mr. Stevenson. And there, in a way, if you recall the case of Donnie versus Stevenson, it involved the, uh, the sale of ginger ale, which was contaminated by a dead snail. Well, the snail had to be dead. It was in the bottle for some time. And um, so you had a, an individual who bought the ginger ale and gave one to his friend. The friend, of, the, because there was no privity of contract between the provider or the seller and even the manufacturer of the ginger ale and the one who drank it because the one who drank the ginger ale and became ill. Uh, did not buy it from the manufacturer, so there was no privative contract. The question then was, was there a potential uh, tortuous liability on the part of the manufacturer whose ginger ale was contaminated and was then uh, drank by uh, another who was not a customer, leading to, you know, to harm. And uh, in that particular case, uh, the court ruled that there, based on the neighbor principle, there was uh, liability on the basis of tort. And the tortuous liability there was based on a misfeasance. It was the provision of uh, it, the negligent act involved or the misfeasance was in providing or selling uh, ginger ale that was committed. In a sense, however, although that can be characterized as misfeasance or the bad, bad doing, or a negligent action. It can also be characterized actually as a non-doing. The non-doing uh, can be in the sense that the, the manufacturer uh, failed to undertake measures to ensure that uh, the, any ginger ale that it produced or sold uh, would be in, in pure form, a form that is suitable for consumption or one that, is, that doesn't have a snail inside. So that's one. There's another case of um, Goldman versus Hargrave. And uh, in, in this particular case, uh, you might remember that this involved an individual upon which the, a hazard was created, not really because of his own doing. So he had a tree in his, in his yard and it was struck by lightning and the tree caught fire. It had to be a massive tree, we suppose. Um, he called the, uh, because it was a huge tree, he didn't have the resources. And he, remember, he didn't cause the fire to the tree. He called upon the uh, fire department to try to extinguish it, but it took a while, about three days before the, the uh, you know, the, the firemen came. But, and, and what had happened is that by that time, after, you know, the, the firemen came, even though an attempt was done by the fire, firemen to try to extinguish the fire, the, the individual just assumed, you know, he didn't have to do anything else. Uh, it turned out that, you know, a few days later, three days later, uh, it was a blazing day, very scorching, it was scorching hot. And as a result, the tree uh, caught fire again. And then uh, upon catching, you know, fire, it then burned uh, a lot of neighboring properties. And the question was, was he under, un, under their circumstances, was his omission, his failure to, uh, his failure to uh, control the fire or to stop the fire from spreading, would that mean that he had committed uh, the tort of negligence? And what exactly did, did he, you know, in, in that scenario, did, did his omission then lead to um, a, a, a liability for any harm or injury that may have eventuated? And the court ruled that based on the neighbor principle, they, he did have a duty of care to the neighbors. And um, he was considered by the court to have then committed a non-feasance or a negligent omission 
in failing to uh, stop the fire, even though, as you notice, he did not originally create the hazard. But in that situation, that omission led to a liability on his part because there was a duty of care. And uh, that duty of care led to a breach of uh, the legal rights of interests of others, which, which caused them harm. So what is clear, therefore, that in law, we know that uh, misfeasance or bad doing can lead to tortuous liability. We also know that the non-doing can lead to tortuous liability. So we know, for example, that um, if you have a swimming pool and you fail to provide proper uh, railings around it, and as a result, somebody gets hurt, it's not an act, it's not your action that caused the injury, but your omission to ensure that injury doesn't happen will lead to your tortuous liability. So in, in, in many cases, non-feasance uh, can lead to tortuous liability. However, again, although we, we've initially talked about Goldman versus Hargrave, what if you did not create the harm? So uh, Goldman versus Hargrave is an exceptional case, but in general, there is no liability for, liability for pure emissions or failure where you did not create the harm. So a common law, there is no liability for pure emissions or failures, even if uh, they may lead to injury. Why? Because when you think about it, if you, if you talk about misfeasance, we know we can easily trace the, the cause of the harm. It is the negligent action of an individual. But when you talk about a failure to act, we talk about an omission. There are so many things that we can omit to do. You know, we, we might omit to probably put a podlock, omit to put an alarm, omit to do this and omit to do that. And so therefore, if you, if a common law, it was so strict that an individual can be liable for, uh, for harm to others, even if there's a duty of care, solely on the basis of pure omissions or failures, you can just imagine the amount of you know, uh, potential liability ca that can be there. So in general, there is no liability for pure omissions or failure, mainly because one, uh, we talk of uh, an inaction being too remote a focus. So you cannot, it's difficult to contemplate, you know, all possible sorts of uh, omissions, unless it's something that's reasonably foreseeable, as we know, for example, in the case of buying Shire Council versus, um, versus Shirt. There's also the issue about theory of individualism in the sense that even if you think that an action, the actions of an individual should always be for the good, should always ensure that it doesn't harm others. There's also the element of uh, individualism in the sense that that is an, an aspiration. We, we sure, we want to do good, but, you know, um, we can't always go out of our way to ensure that we do not commit harm, especially if we are not responsible for causing the harm in the first place. So, um, for example, uh, you, you have a car, and you've locked it up. The question then is, would you have a liability if you know a child actually breaks into the car and uh, drives away and injures himself or injures another? In that particular case, to what extent, you know, was the harm caused by that individual attributable to you as well? Because on the basis of something that can be considered a pure omission or a failure, so. Uh, the idea about, you know, being good Samaritan and trying to do good uh, is a theory. It's a good aspiration, but often not practical. There's also the theory of personal autonomy. And that is like, if there is an individual who has caused harm to himself or is about to cause harm to himself, the question is, and may potentially cause harm to himself, do you have a legal obligation to stop him from causing harm to himself or harm even to others? And that goes to the question of personal autonomy because if you saw somebody causing harm or about to cause harm, like, you know, you saw somebody who is about to be hurt by other people beating up on the street, do you go out of your way to, to stop them? Is there a duty to do that? And uh, if somebody you know, has, has uh, consumed a lot of alcohol in a pub and you saw as a customer, you saw that person about to leave and drive his car away and most likely that will lead to a, a, uh, an accident. 
Do you have a legal obligation to stop it? But if you do, what exactly are you supposed to do? Uh, you know, hold on to the person, lock, uh, uh, put handcuffs on him. And what if you don't? You don't have handcuffs and so on. And even in the front, the viewpoint of the, of the bar owner, he sees a customer walking away and about to, to drive a car while, while drunk. What's the, the, the owner supposed to do? So there'll be questions of, of uh, personal autonomy. Uh, to what, you know, there are limits to what others can do if a particular individual wants or desires to exercise his free will to act in a particular way. And these are some of the reasons why there is a limit to uh, liability for pure emissions when you, as a potential defendant, did not create the harm or the hazard. Now, so going back, there will be three particular scenarios we're going to be examining this module in relation to the affirmative duty to act. One is, do you have an affirmative duty to act, to alleviate or respond to injury to others? So, you know, uh, there might be an emergency, there might be a rescue situation, a child about to drown and so on. Do you have an affirmative duty to act? What if you deal with, uh, what if you come across individuals who are about to harm themselves? or even uh, about to be harmed by others. Uh, as I said, um, there have been a lot of stories, for example, in the US right now, because on the basis of hate crime, where there have been people you know, uh, just walking in front of a door of a building, uh, being mugged or being beaten up by on the basis of racism. And what others do is simply to just lock their doors. They don't do anything. The question is, were there an affirmative duty to act in that particular scenario? Or what if you're a policeman? Do you have a, an affirmative duty to act, however? So these are some of the questions we're looking at, or what if you know somebody who is intent on harming himself or herself? Do you have a positive duty to act? And if you don't act, does it mean that you've committed uh, you know, uh, uh, the tort of negligence? In relation as well to affirmative duty to act, again, what we've often see is a situation where it's an individual, as potential defendant, um, having engaged in negligent action or omission. But what if uh, it, is in, it, it is not you who has uh, caused the harm, but it is somebody else who is about to harm third parties? Would you have an obligation to, to uh, prevent the harm? So this can be in the context of a school where there are children playing around and hurting each other, bullying or you know fighting, does the school who did not you know is not involved in the in the incident, could the school have tortuous liability in the event of injury? Or what if it's in relation to an employer? Uh, what if you have an, uh, co-employees fighting and hurting each other? Would there be an obligation to the part of the employer when the employer certainly wasn't responsible for the injury to the other? Or what if you know the fights in the in the in the in the jail uh, between inmates, and we can assume that it's not the prison authority that uh, was responsible for beating up the inmate. Does the prison authority uh, have a legal liability? So that's the, the, those are issues pertaining to uh, liability for harm to third parties, which we're examining uh, in this particular module. So, as I, as I mentioned uh, in general, there is no duty of care for pure emissions. So in the case of Hargrave uh, versus Goldman, uh, the, the court said that the law casts no doubt upon a man, uh, no duty upon a man to go to the aid of, the, of another who is in peril or distress when it is not caused by him. Although we said that in the case of Hargrave versus Goldman, the court did rule and find that the uh, owner of the tree, uh, who's, you know, the tree that caught fire from a lightning, well, had a, uh, was liable on the basis of a tort of negligence because it was reasonably foreseeable. He had a duty of care. Was reasonably foreseeable that uh, his inaction would uh, would would inaction to extinguish the fire to make sure that the fire would not spread uh, had caused the fire. But in general, there is no duty of care uh, for pure emissions. However, uh, we should know that although there is no duty, general duty of care for pure emissions, there are, as we see here, certain relationships which may lead to a duty of affirmative action. The example I gave was employer and employee. And it can also be in the context of um, a prison authority and inmates. In the case, for example, of New South Wales versus Bujasso, did I pronounce it right? Hopefully I did. 
um, Bujoso was an inmate and he was beaten up by fellow inmates. And the question was, did New South Wales as the uh, prison authority or the public authority have a legal liability on the basis of torts for the failure to prevent the harm upon Bujoso? And uh, the court said, the high court said that it did because there is a duty of care on the part of a prison authority. The, the basic question for us to examine in these scenarios is that why would there be a duty of care on the part of the prison authority, for example, for harm that befell an inmate when that harm was caused by a fellow inmate, right? So again, in a scenario, as I said, you see somebody uh, fighting in the street, do you have a duty of care to protect you know, a stranger from being beaten up by another? So what's, what's the difference there in relation to a prison authority where there is an inmate beating up another inmate? Why would a prison authority have a duty of care? And the court said that that is different because in relation to a prison authority, for example, there is in fact a protective relationship between the defendant, the prison authority, and the plaintiff. And not only that, not only is there a protective relationship, the activities of the plaintiff, the activities of the plaintiff, meaning the, in, the inmate who got injured, are severely curtailed. Even his autonomy is curtailed in a prison system. He has to follow certain systems, follow certain procedures and rules. And for that reason, there are limits to what the, uh, an inmate can do. Uh, an inmate, for example, can carry a knife to protect himself. So in that scenario, there is a protective relationship that has to arise as a matter of common law. And because of that, there's also a protective relationship between the defendant, the prison authority, and third parties, in this particular case, uh, the inmate uh, who was beaten up, even though it wasn't obviously the prison authority itself that, it, that had caused the harm to the, uh, to the inmate. So the point there is that although in general, there is no duty of care for pure omissions, there may be certain relationships which may lead to a duty of care. And a duty, not only a duty of care, but a duty of affirmative action. Now, in the scenario we talked about, about you, know, um, you seeing uh, a stranger be, be, being beaten up by another, and you happen to be nearby, you actually don't have a legal obligation to intervene. Because in that scenario, not only is there no duty of care, there's also no duty of affirmative action uh, recognized by the law. And we're going to look at this uh, more closely in relation to the duty uh, to rescue based on the idea of the Good Samaritan, which we're all familiar with uh, based on the Bible. So when we, look, when we look at the idea of the case of the Good Samaritan, uh, a Good Samaritan is a person who voluntarily assists a person in an emergency or in need uh, based on the Bible. Now, the, the question though, is that when you talk about uh, the, 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 the Good Samaritan, when a Good Samaritan tries to rescue another or tries to prov provide help, even when he has no affirmative duty to act. So remember, there is no duty to rescue as we said, correct? So there is no duty, there is no affirmative duty to be a Good Samaritan. There is no such thing. However, what if, even though there is no affirmative duty to be a good Samaritan, no affirmative duty to rescue, you do rescue somebody or you do attempt to rescue somebody. And what if in the process, you know, uh, it causes harm to the person being injured, which can be possible, right? Uh, in, in a movie that I saw, movie was that? Um, a well-known actor, uh, he saw somebody about to die and he assumed, he wasn't a medical doctor, I think, but he watched a movie and he assumed that because of the breathing problems of that person who was on the prone on the floor, uh, it was a problem with the, with the lungs. And what he did was he took out a ball pen, an American movie. He took out the, you know, the one with the ink and he plunged it into the, into the lung. And it released air in the lung, which allowed the person to survive. I don't know the medical condition because I'm not the medical doctor, but you might think of scenarios where, you know, uh, somebody does not appear, is, appears to be unresponsive, is not breathing and so on. And somebody does CPR 
in doing so, the person breaks the ribs of the person, especially if you know the one may, you know, the, the one, the victim may be a child. So there is injury because somebody has been trying to be good, not trying to be nice as a good Samaritan. Is there liability for that? In most states other than Queensland, there is now Good Samaritan legislation so that where the Good Samaritan um, is providing help, trying to rescue somebody, but in the process causes injury to the person being helped or being rescued, he is not liable for the injury, except when uh, the injury was occasioned. Uh, okay, unless it was the Good Samaritan who in the first place caused occasion the emergency. So you can't be considered a good Samaritan if you yourself was the one who occasioned the emergency. So, for example, if you were playing around, uh, if you're both, you know, you had a friend, you were in a boat, and you're mucking around, trying to make fun and, the, and trying to, you know, get each other off the boat, and then somebody, your friend, does fall off the boat and then begins to drown. You then try to save him, and in doing so, you cause him injury. The question is, because you were a good Samaritan, are you covered with the Good Samaritan legislation? The answer is no, because you occasioned. Uh, because the, you caused the injury, which caused the emergency in the first place. And if, as a good Samaritan, you were in intoxicated in some way and failed to exercise reasonable care, the good Samaritan legislation in most states other than Queensland also will not apply. So the, the crucial point as well is that in relation to Queensland, there is no good Samaritan statutory provision in Queensland. Okay, so there is no good, no good Samaritan statute provision, unlike in other states. However, there uh, are provisions in the Civil Liabilities Act 2003 Queensland. Uh, this is 26. Protecting persons performing duties for entities to enhance public safety. So if you are a person performing duties for an entity, so in other words, you might be an emergency worker or, or a first aid worker and so on. And, uh, and it's the purpose is to enhance public safety. Safety it might be a fire officer, might be a police officer. And in doing so, you cause harm or injury. Then you are covered by uh, this particular legislation protected from liability for tort. The prescribed entity itself is which performs duties to enhance public safety is also protected uh, from liability, again, when there is no gross negligence. In Section 38A of the Civil Liabilities Act of Health Center Queensland, there's also protection for food donors, protection of volunteers, and uh, in the case of medical practitioners and nurse, nurses and other prescribed persons, there is also protection under Section 16 of the Law Reform Act of 1995, again, when there is no gross negligence or, or when there is no occasion where the, the person trying to rescue is intoxicated and it is that intoxication uh, which uh, can be considered to have led to the harm uh, to a victim. Now let's look, look at uh, protection of volunteers uh, in particular. So what we need to know is that I, I already mentioned that there is no good Samaritan statute or statutory provision in Queensland. So what does it mean then when because there is a provision which says, you know, volunteers, there's protection for volunteers. The volunteers under Section 38 of the Civil Liability Act is not equivalent to the Good Samaritan, mainly because under the, under the strict definitions of Section 38 of the Civil Liability Act, a volunteer is an individual who does community work on a voluntary basis. So obviously, if you're a man on the street and you, you begin to rescue somebody, that's not exactly community work or donates food to the circumstances mentioned in Section 39.3 of the Civil Liabilities Act, that would be considered a volunteer. However, so we're, we're clear, right? Under the Queensland legislation, the volunteer under that provision is not the same as a Good Samaritan because of the clear definition there. However, it also doesn't follow that even though there is a protection for volunteers under Section 39, it doesn't mean that all potential liability is excluded uh, the a volunteer can still be liable for criminal acts under Section 40. The volunteer can also be liable if he was intoxicated when doing the work and failed to exercise due care and skill when doing the work under Section 40, 41. If he acted outside the scope of activities or contrary to instructions, 
if insurance is required and for motor vehicle accidents. Uh, I, for one, um, engage in the practice as a volunteer solicitor in two uh, legal centers in, in Queenstown, or in, 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 in Brisbane in particular. And what if I uh, commit negligent action in the sense that I provide uh, incorrect legal advice? I would have been considered a volunteer under the provisions of the law, but uh, in doing so, if I committed negligent action, remember it doesn't have to be gross negligence. But if from from a simple negligence, uh, I you know my my legal advice leads to harm, I actually still uh, would not be protected by uh, the Civil Liability Act under uh, Section thirty nine because. I would be required to be covered by insurance. So there is, there is public indemnity insurance for those who engage in the practice of law. Okay. Now, we, we, okay, we, we said that there is no duty to rescue. What happens then? And we said that if the rescuer causes harm, there is good Samaritan legislation to protect him from uh, from liability in the event that his attempt to rescue or his actions in rescuing another causes harm or injury to the victim. So we have that good Samaritan rule. What if you have a scenario where, uh, although there is no duty to rescue, somebody does uh, seek to rescue another, but in doing so, the rescuer himself is injured. Uh, typically, uh, there is a defense of volenti non fit injuria. There is a voluntary assumption of risk uh, we now know that when a person seeks to rescue another, even though there is no common law duty to rescue another, and in, in circumstances where it can be risky, it doesn't follow that there is a voluntary assumption of risk. So in other words, um, a defendant who causes injury to a rescuer cannot say that the, he does not have any legal liability because the rescuer voluntarily assumed the risk of rescuing another in circumstances which were dangerous. So the defense of voluntary non-fit injuria will not apply. So a typical example is a case of Chapman versus Hearst. Uh, we recall that uh, in this particular case, Mr. Chapman, the driver was negligent and in driving negligently, he caused injuries to himself. And so, you know, uh, because he caused injuries to himself while driving his car, uh, there was a doctor, Dr. Cherry, who came to rescue him, you know, uh, on the side of the road or, the, or on the road. The, the problem, however, was that there was an individual named Hearst. So Hearst, Hearst is usually, you know, associate them with death, right? And he ended up uh, running over Dr. Cherry, who died. So, so apt. Uh, the question then is, um, was Dr. Was Chapman, so it's pretty obvious Hearst because he ran over Dr. Cherry would have to be liable on the basis of torts. But the question is, would it be legally correct and proper for Hearst to then implead uh, Chapman who was you know, the, the, the one who initially initiated this chain of events by his negligent actions and in injuring himself, which led to Dr. Cherry trying to rescue him. And the, 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 the court said that, yes, even though Chapman did not cause the injury to Dr. Cherry because it was, doctor, because it was first who did it, he still had a legal liability on the basis of tort because when he created the danger, when Chapman created the danger by injuring himself, and inviting rescue, it was res reasonably foreseeable that there would be a rescuer. And so therefore, it was the actions of uh, Chapman, which led to this chain of events that led to the death of Dr. Cherry. And so Chapman was held uh, legal liability, legally liable for tort, even though he did not, he was not directly responsible for the death of uh, Dr. Cherry. Okay, let's look at another scenario now. We're looking at the duty of care to third parties. So 
uh, what we've covered so far were issues about uh, the Good Samaritan and the fact that there is no uh, duty to rescue anyone. Uh, well, I, should, I should point out that although there is in general no duty to rescue anyone, again, I pointed out that there are established relationships that there will arise a duty of care and a duty to rescue, uh, especially in the context of uh, a parent in relation to a vulnerable child, in relation to an employer, in relation to an employee, and so on. Okay, but in general, there is no uh, duty of care to rescue anyone. Now, we, we now talk about the duty of care to third parties. Uh, again, we said that for the most part uh, in, in this particular unit or in this unit, we had said that when we talked about torts and negligent action or omission, we were talking about a defendant himself or herself having committed negligent acts or omissions that then led to injury or harm to another individual where there was a duty of care, okay? So you have the plaintiff because uh, who sues uh, for the tort of negligence uh, or tort in negligence because of the negligent action or omission of a particular defendant. But can there be situations where the injuries or harm suffered by a plaintiff is caused not by a defendant himself, but by another person. So what if you have an employee who hurts another, a, a co-employee, can the employer be liable? In other words, can the employer be liable, would, would the employer have a duty of care towards a third party? Or you can have a situation, as I mentioned, the police authority, where inmates fight, one of the inmates gets bashed, is injured. Does the prison authority have a duty of care to that third party? Because the, the prison authority did not uh, commit the act injuring the uh, inmate himself. So as a general rule, the common law imposes no obligation on a person to control the actions of another. So there is no obligation. Uh, there is a ju no duty of care to third parties. In particular, there is no duty under the common law on a person to control the actions of another. So uh, if I see, for example, if I'm walking on the street and I see a person stalking a lady and that person then commits certain acts against the lady, I do not have a, even if I was aware, uh, and even if I could have intervened, I do not have a duty of care to the third party. So we're clear. We, we've, so that's part of the, uh, the, the, the principles we talked about in relation to there being no duty to be a rescuer. However, uh, there are certain circumstances, as we see later on, where there might be a duty of care. In the case of Smith versus Lurs, for example, this involved a situation where there was a 13-year-old year, 13 year old son of the defendants was playing around with a slingshot. And in doing so, uh, outside of the house, he ended up injuring a, a friend. So the injuries were caused by the 13-year-old son, not by the parents. But could the victim uh, sue the, the parents of the child who fired the slingshot? And the court said, yes, uh, under the circumstances, there is a duty of care on the part of the parents of the 13 year old child to ensure that the child, their child does not cause harm to another uh, in, in, those, in that situation. So there is, on the part of the parents, there is, there is a duty of care to third parties that their children, their vulnerable children do not cause harm to, the, to others. But in this particular case, the court ruled that the parents were not, in fact, uh, negligent uh, in their actions because, yes, although there was a duty of care, uh, there was no uh, negligence that was involved because they did uh, provide clear instructions to their child and admonitions not to use this, you know, to, to use the sling, slingshot in a way that would not harm others. So again, it is one thing to say that there is a duty of care, a duty of care even to third parties. But it is totally another to, talk, to determine whether or not there has been a breach of the duty of care based on uh, questions about the nature and extent 
or standard of the duty of care. In the case of Mudbury uh, Triangle Shopping Center versus Angel, uh, this involved a situation where a video store employee was attacked at a car park of the Mudbury Triangle Shopping Center. And it was the argument or the position of the plaintiff that the Mudbury Triangle Shopping Center owed it a duty of care because he was in the shopping center's car park and the shopping center could have, you know, provided security measures to prevent harm to him. And, you know, when you think about it, that, that's, imagine going to being in a shopping center with the shopping center have a duty of care so that their, you know, fellow uh, shoppers don't harm you. The court ruled uh, in this case that there is no duty of care on the part of the shopping center um, to the video store employee. Apologies for my eyes. You know what's going on. So that uh, it, be, because the, the, the video store employee was attacked not by an employee of the shopping center, but by a total stranger who was certainly not under the control of the Mudbury Tri Triangle Shopping Center. So in this particular scenario, the, the court, the high court ruled that there was no legal obligation on the part of Mudbury Triangle Shopping Center uh, to prevent harm to a video store employee harm that was uh, committed by uh, a total stranger. Now, I did mention that there are certain relationships which may give rise to protective duties. There are certain relationships where there may be a duty of care to third parties. So an example is the case, uh, in the case, uh, an example would be the relationship between employer and employee. In the case of Gitani Stone Proprietor Limited versus Vavkovic, um, one of the, the, the defend, one of the, the, the plaintiff had often been bullied by a co-employee uh, and the plaintiff had in fact complained to management, you know, complaining about the bullying and, and the, uh, the actions of a co-employee, the, manage, the management failed to, uh, to really take action on the complaint. Eventually, the co-employee ended up shooting the plaintiff. The question was, because it wasn't the, obviously it wasn't the employer that shot the plaintiff, did the employer have a legal liability for the injury or harm to the plaintiff? Harm that was committed by a, a co-employee and the answer was yes. Because uh, in that scenario of an employer and employee, there is a duty of care on the part of the employer to a third party. Uh, so in other words, to an employee that it had. I mentioned already the case of uh, parents and children as an established relationship where there is a duty of care to third parties, the case of Smith versus Lurs, which means that parents have a duty of care to ensure the children in their ward, vulnerable children in their care, do not cause harm to others. The same is true with the case of schools and pupils, teachers and pupils. In the case of Gare versus Down, an eight-year-old girl was severely injured by another school girl. Well, they were playing unsupervised uh, in, in a playground before school started. So when you think about it, you, we often, you know, sometimes bring kids, our kids, let them play around uh, in the school playgrounds, unsupervised. What if an injury occurs? Would the school be liable? Because now uh, in my daughter, uh, in my daughter's case, for example, she's 10 at her school. If the school hasn't started yet, they are then all asked to go to a particular uh, hall where they could be supervised. The question is why, why does it have to be done? Why can't the kids just be allowed to you know, play around um, unsupervised in the playground? The, the point is, the reason is the, the high court has ruled that there is a duty of care on the part of schools and teachers in relation to their pupils. So that uh, if there is harm that is caused to one of their pupils or students by another, even if they, the school itself was not responsible for the harm directly, they can still be held liable because they have a duty of care to third parties. The same thing is true with bullying behavior in schools. If there is bullying in schools and a school fails to stop the bullying and as a result that leads to harm to a student, the school can be held liable. 
I also mentioned the case of prison authority, prison authorities and inmates where because of the diminished level of autonomy on the part of inmates and the tight control imposed by the prison authority in the structured environment of an inmate, there is a duty of care to third parties, a duty of care the part of prison authorities that an inmate does not, uh, is not injured by a fellow inmate or any other individual. Now, an interesting question arises in relation to pubs and patrons. Uh, in Australia, which I found uh, pretty interesting, uh, a lot of people, you know, there, there are, uh, how do you call them, BWS, we've got a lot of these uh, drink stores, forgot the name, I, I don't really drink. So, uh, but you know, it's pretty common, it's fun. My kids do it as well, they drink a lot. And uh, so drinking appears to be fun. Uh, in my case, it's eating that's fun. So, but I don't get drunk from eating. But uh, you, you, it, it's typical that, especially on Friday nights and Saturday nights, actually almost any day for that matter, uh, people go to bars and restaurants to drink and often to get drunk. And the question is, you know, uh, in that situation, would a pub, aware that one of its patrons or customers is severely drunk, would it have a duty of care to ensure that the person doesn't, is, is it harmed? There are many ways that the person could get harmed. It could be that, you know, the, per, the, the drunk person walks towards the bathroom or the toilet, uh, slips on the floor, very reliability in the part of the pub, or in situations where uh, you might have a, 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 a patron, severely drunk, going, you know, getting into his car and driving away and then being injured was their liability on the part of the, or the pub. Should the pub have tried to stop the individual from driving off? And we did cover this uh, in, 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 in quiz one. So let's examine this. In the case of Cal, number 14, Proprietary Limited versus Motor Accidents Insurance Board. In this situation, the pub, uh, uh, saw one of its patrons drinking heavily and the patron actually uh, surrendered his keys to the pub because he said, you know, he didn't want to drive because he was drunk. He was just going to ask his wife to, to, um, to collect him from the pub. But at some point, the, the drunk patron decided to leave anyway, and he did on his motorcycle. He got his keys. The question for the, uh, for the pub was, should he have tried to stop the, uh, the, the drunk patron from driving away on his motorcycle, given the fact that you know, uh, there was a huge likelihood that the drunk patron would get hurt. Should he have been stopped? And if the, if the pub failed to do that, would it incur liability? And uh, because the, eventually the drunk, drunk patron left and he injured himself and he died. So it was now the wife suing uh, on behalf of the husband, uh, suing the, the, the defendant. The court ruled that the pub was not uh, liable under the circumstances. The court ruled that yes, there is a duty of care. There could be a duty of care on the part of the pub to third parties, but not under the circumstances because what exactly was the pub meant to do? Was, was the pub meant to restrain the drunk patron from leaving? Was the, drunk, was the pub meant to lock up the motorcycle? But that would lead to you know, um, potential crime for, of death in your conversion. Uh, or even, you know, restraint, that, that would be a crime as well. And that would also uh, severely impinge on the uh, personal autonomy of the drunk patron to be restrained from leaving. And can you imagine Bob saying, oh, for those who have been drunk, you can't leave the premises. It, it, that can't be done. So the court ruled that the pub was not uh, legally liable, although it did have a duty of care. Uh, a, an almost similar scenario happened in the case of Cole versus South Tweed Heads Rugby League Football Club. And uh, in this particular case, the plaintiff sued the pub because the pub failed to stop her when the pub was aware that she was heavily intoxicated. And because she left uh, the pub in a heavily intoxicated state because she wasn't, wasn't stopped by the pub, she was then run, run, ran over by a car outside the defendant's club. Was the pub liable? The answer was no. Again, issues about personal autonomy. Now, looks, let's look at the case of Adil's Palace Proprietor Limited versus Mabarak. Again, we recall that this involved a, a, a 
situation where there was altercation among patrons uh, in the restaurant. One of the patrons eventually left. The one, one of the patrons, the protagonists, uh, who was in a fight. But then he came back and then he shot an employee of the restaurant and he, he then shot another patron whom he had fought with earlier. The question was, was the pub liable for the injury too? I mean, it was obviously obvious it was liable to the employee, but was it liable as well to a patron who was shot by another patron? And the answer was yes. Uh, no, 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 hang on. The answer was no. There was a duty of care, but under the circumstances, the answer, the answer was no. There was no liability on the part of Adil's Palace because even though there was a duty of care on the part of Adil's Palace to protect uh, third parties within, uh, to protect its patrons from harm by another individual, under the circumstances, what exactly was Adil's Palace supposed to do? Uh, it was an argument made by the defendant that you know, it should have added more security personnel, added more security features to ensure that it did not happen. But the court said that, you know, when you look at the, uh, the calculus of negligence and the potential burden uh, of alleviating measures that Adil's Palace had to undertake, uh, it wasn't practicable uh, for uh, Adil's Palace to have to do this in order to prevent harm. So in that case, uh, Adil's Palace was held not to have breached its duty of care to third parties. But if you have a situation where a pub, there's, you know, there has been altercation among drunk patrons or among patrons in a pub and the pub does nothing. And as a result of the fight among patrons, one of them gets hurt. In that scenario, the, the pub would have a liability for, for on the basis of the tort of negligence because it has a duty of care to third parties in that scenario. Okay, so we're done with that part. Uh, we're now moving to uh, a discussion of uh, the liability of public authorities, which is part two. Let's be clear about, let's, let's first have a clear understanding of uh, what or who a public authority is. When we speak of a public authority, this in this context, we're speaking of a statutory authority or a, an authority that is created by statute. So when we speak of a statute, uh, there are only two sources of statutes, at least in Australia, statutes passed by the federal parliament and statutes passed by the state. And because these are, uh, and when we speak of statutory authority, typically we're dealing with uh, those belonging to the executive arm of government. Remember we have, the, we have the parliament, we have the judiciary, but because it is the executive which is typically responsible for meeting the direct needs of citizens, on the basis of laws that have been passed by, by the parliament. So we're, when you speak of uh, statutory authority, these are usually statutory executive authority. Uh, examples might be city and local councils, fire departments, police, health departments, road and uh, rail, rail and transport authorities, which are entrusted by statute with functions to be performed in the public interest or for public purposes. Um, we need to be clear that uh, public authority typically does not arise in relation to parliaments, uh, mainly because the duty of parliaments would be to create laws. And that duty to create laws falls solely upon the parliament, whether or not it wants to create a particular law or not. And if it does not, that becomes a political question. And uh, because it is a political question, it is what is known as non-justiciable by the courts. And it would be very difficult to, to uh, impose liability on, on parliaments, therefore. So when you speak of public authority here, we're typically speaking of public executive authority. So these are powers and responsibilities specified and regulated by the statute, which creates authority. We need to be clear when you speak of uh, public authority, it, there are two duties involved. One is statutory duty, and the other one is the common law duty of care, or even a common law duty. Uh, the statute duty would be duties that have been defined and prescribed by the statute itself. It so would say this particular you know, statutory body has the following duties. So in that case, the statute duty is defined or could be implied by the statute. The other part is a statutory body may not have a specific or even an implied duty, but it has certain powers. And so therefore, if it has certain powers, 
in the exercise of those powers, there is a common luxury of care that the exercise of those powers uh, does not lead to injury. So therefore there are two parts to the uh, duties of a public authority. You've got statutory duty defined or implied by a statute, then there is common law duty. The courts are saying that if a statutory body has certain duties and certain powers, the exercise of the ju duties and powers uh, must involve a duty of care that th their exercise does not cause harm to others. Okay, so moving on. Now, in relation, so we said there are two types of duty, statutory duty and common law duty. There are three types of potential liabilities in an action of negligence in relation to public authorities. One is the breach of the statutory duty. So here, uh, okay, failure to act, no. Okay, so the first one is a breach of statutory duty by failing to act or what is known as non-feasance. So if there is a duty, there is an expectation that that duty has to be discharged. It has to be complied with, it has to be fulfilled. So when a public authority does not fulfill or discharge its, its statutory duty, that leads to a non-feasance. In that case, that can lead to public authority liability. So uh, for example, if there might be a duty to fix roads, stop a disturbance, extinguish a fire on the part of the, of the fire department, if it fails to, you know, if any of these public authorities fail to comply with their statutory duty, that would lead to public liability because that in that sense is a, uh, an unfeasance or a failure to act. There can also be a breach of statutory duty such that even though the statutory agency or statutory body may actually be complying or fulfilling its statutory duty, it may do so in a, in a negligent way or negligent fashion, which is misfeasance. So if a statutory, statutory agency or body does fulfill its duty, but it is negligent in doing so, then uh, it exposes itself to potential liability in an action for negligence. The third one is that, as we said, there are common law duties that are imposed uh, on certain statutory bodies uh, because they have certain powers that need to be fulfilled. And that is that uh, when a statutory body uh, undertakes its duties or functions, it must make sure that it does so uh, with an understanding that it has a duty of care. So that when the, the public authority is careless in the exercise of his statutory powers or careless in the exercise of his statutory duties and it leads to harm, there would be uh, liability as well. Okay, so we will see that the distinction across the three is that one is based on a duty that is founded on statute. The other one is a duty founded on the common law, particularly the common law duty of care. Oh, Ah, and by the way, before we, 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 we need to clarify as well, when we speak, for example, of a failure to act the breach of statutory duty, uh, and we, we, we go into the issues about administrative law, uh, we will often come across what is known as the writ of mandamus. And both under the common law and even uh, under section 75 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution in relation to uh, officers of the Commonwealth, and the law provides that when a public authority fails to undertake a duty and there is a right on the part of an individual to ensure that that particular duty is discharged, then an individual in, in administrative law proceedings can compel a, an, a, a public authority to discharge its duties under the law. So, the point being that when a, a public authority fails to discharge its duty, there are two possible uh, remedies for an individual. Uh, take a, a administrative law measures, which means perhaps a writ of mandamus to compel the performance of a public duty, or when, when there has been harm, uh, file an action on the basis of torts for the breach of a statute duty, in particular, the failure to act or non-feasance. But we're not talking about administrative law here. I'm just exposing you to the idea that because we're dealing with the public authority, there are remedies available both under civil law as well as public law, particularly in the field of administrative law. 
Okay, now public authority liability, we, we, we do have some special problems, however. We know that when a public authority exercises statutory powers, we understand that uh, it is expected to exercise reasonable care in order to avoid misfeasance, in order to avoid causing harm to another. So that in the case of Caledonian collieries uh, versus Spears, the court said so that if those who exercise them could by reasonable precaution have prevented an injury which was occasioned and was likely to be occasioned by their exercise, damages for negligence may be recovered. So in those situations, uh, based on this case, if a statutory agency in exercising its powers failed to exercise reasonable care and that led to harm, then the public authority will be held liable. Uh, there are, however, problems which exist because when we say that a particular agency or a statutory agency or public authority exercises its duties or fails to discharge its duties, uh, in, and one of the problems is that this is often set or provided by statute. So what the public authority can or cannot do to a great extent is actually controlled by the statute. It can't go beyond uh, what the statute provides because what that is, what is considered in constitutional or even administrative law to be uh, an ultra virus exercise of power. So there are limits to what the public authority can do. And because there are limits to what the, the, the uh, public authority can do, there are limits perhaps to what it can do in the discharge of its powers or what it cannot do uh, or you know, uh, when, when it fails to discharge its powers because it is governed by statute. And what if the exercise of these powers then lead to harm? That can be a vexing question because as I said, much of what the public authority does is really governed and controlled by statute. The other point is, and we're gonna be discussing this in greater detail in a short while, is that even though we might say that it can be reasonably foreseeable for a public authority, that its failure to act in a particular way may cause harm. So for example, uh, my wife and I went to Cairns and we went on the Karana Express train. There were places there where the train would stop. And, you know, there's always the danger that when, when you're on a, on a mountain, you could fall off, fall off a mountain. Can you say fall off a cliff from a mountain? Perhaps, yep. Or there might be parks where there might be danger. There's always that danger everywhere. But would it mean that, you know, the public authority because it's reasonably foreseeable that it can cause harm. They've got to seal off everything so that people don't get injured. Make sure that you know there are no rocks and wood littering around so that people people could stumble and get hurt. And you know, so in other words, to what what to what extent must public authorities public authorities act to ensure that there is no harm to individuals? The problem, though, is that any public authority or any government has limited resources. Resources are not unlimited. And because resources are unlimited, are not unlimited, uh, the public authority has to make decisions as to where to spend money. So should fences be built? Should, should um, you know, walks be cleared of debris and so on, et cetera. There are issues. So part of them are policy choices. Some of them are operational, like operational choices, which we're examining. And that these can cause problems as we see later on. If the decisions by a public authority are based on policy decisions, and because of policy decisions, the, a particular public authority does not act in a particular way to prevent harm. And yet there is harm, there still would be no liability on the part of a public authority. But if it is an operational decision, so in other words, there is a policy which says you should have done this, but it wasn't done. And that failure to do causes harm, there will be liability on the part of a public authority. And I'll discuss that more in detail. In, in many cases, uh, the treatment of public authority liability is not subject to legislation in some states. And we're gonna be covering that as well here uh, as we look at section 35 and 36. For now, uh, let's talk about policy and operational decisions. So as I pointed out, if it is a policy decision, a policy choice, 
So in, if it's a policy choice, it's at a higher level. It's a consideration of who exactly are our constituents, what are our priorities, this is the amount of money we have, these are our timelines, then we make decisions. So these are policy or planning and discretionary decisions that are made. These are often also considered to be what are known as political decisions. It, they don't involve legal standards, they're political decisions, which ought to be made only by people who are appointed uh, by the uh, by citizens or, uh, you know, uh, based on a representative democracy, they are the ones who have been given the power to make decisions on behalf of, of the citizenry. In that case, if it is a policy decision and the policy decision leads to certain actions or inactions which lead to harm, there will be no liability on the part of the public authority because these are not reviewable, but reviewable, reviewable by the courts, mainly based on the principle of non-justiciability. In other words, it's a political question. Uh, if it's a political question, it is a question that is best left to those who are elected or appointed by, uh, by citizens and not for the courts to get into because, especially because courts uh, are, make decisions based on legal standards. Courts have, cannot make decisions on the basis of political standards may, be based on who should get what. Now, however, if it is an operational decision, follow the case of Anne's versus Merton London Borough Council, and it's about putting policy into practice. These can be uh, reviewable by reviewable by courts in negligence and more likely to attract the duty of care. So in the case of Anne's versus Mer Merton London Borough Council, um, there was a claim on the part of the plaintiff that the Merton, Merton Borough London, London Borough Council getting hungry, sorry, it's almost 12 o'clock for me, uh, because the council had the responsibility to regulate and issue permits uh, it, should, it could have prevented uh, the issuance of permits, which then le led to the uh, to the buildings, which were in de de decrepit condition. And in that particular case, uh, the court said that the, uh, if it was an operational decision, then it was something that was reviewable by the courts. Now, sometimes it can, however, be difficult to draw a distinction between what is an operational decision and a policy decision because they can really be intermixed. So for example, when there is overcrowding and a failure to build a bigger prison system, would that be a policy decision or is that an operational decision, especially in terms of how to avoid or minimize overcrowding? Uh, the failure to, to keep classes of prisoners separate, those who are high-risk prisoners, vulnerable prisoners, very violent prisoners and so on, uh, the questions about making regular inspection patrols, they can be seen as operational decisions, but it can also be considered to be policy decisions given constraints about resources. So there can be a, a, a crucial distinction there. And that crucial distinction is important, as we said, because if it's a policy decision, it is not reviewable, reviewable by the courts. If it's an operational decision, courts can review it. Okay. so. We talked about Section 35 of the Civil Liabilities Act, uh, Queensland. And uh, under that particular statute, under Section 35, it provides for principles concerning resources, responsibilities, et cetera, public authorities. So it says that the principle in terms of uh, concerning resources is that the following principles apply to a proceeding in deciding whether a public or other authority has a duty or has reached a duty. It has functions required to be exercised by the authority, which are limited by the financial and other resources, questions about allocation of financial and other resources, questions about uh, a reference to a broad range of issues, and so on. So uh, in other words, when we seek to determine whether or not a public authority may have breached its duties, the court is required to pay attention to section 35 uh, in relation to the principles concerning uh, the use of resources by public authorities in order to determine whether or not there was a breach of duty of care. In section 36, in relation to proceedings against public or other authorities based on a breach of statutory duty, uh, in, the, in par paragraph two, for the purposes of the proceeding, an act or a mission of the authority does not constitute a wrongful exercise or failure to exercise. So in other words, wrongful exercise is the misfeasance 
failure is the non-feasance, the failure to, to act, does not constitute a wrongful exercise or failure unless the act or remission was in the circumstances so unreasonable that no public or other authority having the functions of the authority in question could properly consider the act or remission to be a re reasonable exercise of its functions. We should know that when we speak of unreasonableness, this is actually tied to the case of um, Associated Provincial Pictures Housing Limited versus Wensbury Corporation, uh, a case in the UK, which is a very important case in administrative law. The point being that when a decision is made by a public authority, uh, a decision in relation or an act or mission in relation to its actions, which are considered to be wrongful or its failure to act, an omission which is non-feasance. People can say, oh, those actions or omissions were unreasonable, okay? And the question is, if that is the case, if it is considered unreasonable, does it mean then that the public authority is, uh, is liable? No, it is in, not enough the, that the argument or claim is made that the actions were unreasonable. It must be actions that are so unreasonable that no public or other authority having the function of the authority could properly consider the act or omission to be a reasonable exercise of its omission. So it's a very high standard. It has to be what is known as Wensbury and reasonableness. It is not enough that it's merely unreasonable because uh, the course have said that if you talk of what's unreasonable, what's unreasonable can be quite subjective. Uh, and people can have different views. But when we talk about Wensbury and reasonableness, uh, what it essentially means is that if, if there are many possible actions that a public authority can take, for there to be Wensbury and reasonableness, there has to be kind of a general agreement or consensus that there is only one correct way, or, that, or it could be that that act that was undertaken had to be wrong. But if a public authority had options to undertake actions and, it, and any of those actions could be reasonable from the viewpoint of any reasonable person or reasonable public authority, that will not amount to, uh, to Wensbury and reasonableness. In the, um, one of the comments made by De Smith and Bashir is that if you speak of an Wensbury and reasonableness, it suggests that it has to be a preposterous decision, something so overwhelming so overwhelmingly unreasonable. So it's not enough that it's just illogical. It's not enough that it's unsound. It's not enough that it's just unreasonable. It has to meet the requirements of Winsbury unreasonableness. Okay, so we've gone through this. At the end of this module, you should be able to understand the legal distinction between acts and pure emissions from both a practical and historical perspective. Explain the approach of the common law to pure nonfeasance and the circumstances in which liability may be imposed. Discuss the protection from liability afforded to Good Samaritans and volunteers. Identify, explain, and apply the principles of liability for public authorities and emissions at both common law and under the Civil Liability Act 2003 Queensland. And explain the difference between an action for breach of statute to duty and an action in negligence against public authorities. Thank you for watching this video. And uh, I'm your unit coordinator again, Dr. Manjo Oisen. Thanks for watching. See you in a few days. Bye.